Listen, that's pretty hard when you have bronchitis. You should have been in earlier. You could have led the singing. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. We always begin our services by reading to you some of the emails and some of the letters we get from around the country and around the world. Right now, we are live streaming all over the world. There's people watching in Ireland and England, and believe it or not, that's hard to believe, but that's true. Down in Brazil, and, and I hope they're watching down in Ecuador. Our missionaries down there, are you guys watching? Yep. Nod your head, yes. Oh, they nodded yes. It's good to see you, Scott, and, uh, and Steve, and all the gang, and all the girls and boys, and, uh, and people watching us in Japan. We're on TV in about 200 different towns and cities, and these DVDs will be going out to some of you folks, and uh, we're glad to have you. We got a letter here from Charmaine Villa Brera. She watches us on TV in New York and Brooklyn. Hi, how are you? I wanted to say thank you for all the great teachings of the Bible. I look forward to receiving more DVDs in the future. Charmaine Villabrera, Brooklyn, New York. Then got a letter from Ricky Collins, Sturgis, Mississippi. Hi, you, Jim, Tom, Miss Mary, and all at Grace and Truth. Hope this finds you all doing well and good. I got three more DVDs today in the mail and wanted to write and say thank you all very much for them. I have told my cousin about y'all, and he said he was interested in Jim's teachings and would be writing y'all about DVDs so he can learn what Jim is teaching. I hope that he will do so. I have not been doing very well health-wise and financially, but hearing Jim's message has been a big help in keeping me going. I learn so much from Jim every time I watch y'all online on DVDs. Keep on. Bless you all. Agape Ricky. And uh, this on YouTube, this Abba is Science has made a comment on sons of God marry the daughters of men. Explain, angels did not sleep with women. That's exactly true. Sons of God means believer, a one born of God. By born of God, I mean born again believer. Anyone can be born again. Not anyone, only God's elect. And his elect will. His elect will desire that. There was a day when the sons of God presented themselves. The sons of God, to be called a son of someone, the word is, a, the prefix is bar or ben. Bar, Simon bar Jonah means son of Jonah, but it didn't mean that uh, Jonah was, that Peter's father's name was Jonah. It meant that Peter, that his spiritual father, to be a son of someone meant to do the will of the father. Jesus told the Pharisees, the works of your father you will do, your father's the devil, and we are sons of God. So sons of God is not fallen angels. That's not true. You, to be a son of, we are sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. We know when he appears, we'll be like him. We'll see him as he is. Uh, Sabbath is the day of the sons of God. The Sabbath is not, Sabbath does not mean seventh. It means rest, and I go through that. Every day is the Sabbath now, and I don't have time to go into that. Uh, Satan is wandering to and fro on the earth, and so God could ask Satan about Job, and rightly so, because Satan's been following him more than any other man because he is a son of God. No, he's not. Satan is not a son of God. He doesn't do the will of the Father. To be called a son of someone, you had to be doing that will. Jesus said, my brothers and my sisters and my mother are those who do the will of the Father. So if you're doing the will of the Father, you're a son of God. If you not, you're a son of Satan. Uh, I don't know what this is. Uh, well, this is a uh, man arrested after telling kids Santa isn't real. A real-life Grinch was arrested after he spoiled the holiday cheer at a parade telling the children Santa isn't real. The unidentified 24-year-old man who had his hair gelled to look as though devil horns were protruding from his head was arrested by police in the Canadian town of Kingston last week during the annual Santa Claus parade, authorities said, statement, the St. Nicholas naysayer, St. Nicholas was a 4th century Roman Catholic priest from Myra, that was in what we call uh, Turkey, or they call it Asia Minor. Uh, St. Nicholas naysayer faces criminal charges of causing a disturbance by being drunk. That's why they arrested him, not because he said Santa Claus was, wasn't real. And breach of probation. No, oh, okay. I'm not even going to read the rest of that. That's silly. Oh, oh, all right. We got a, a letter here from uh, 
Linda Tyndall. She's in Northern Ireland. And if you're watching, Linda, we love you and love you, family. Love you for believing the truth. Dear brother, just a note to say hello and hope everyone is well. We really do need fellowship over here in Ireland. Daryl's dad has tried to get us to the church that he goes to, which is Presbyterian. If the Presbyterians believe what they believed 150 years ago, you could go there, but they don't believe that anymore. They don't believe in the doctrines of the sovereignty of God, predestination, election, etc. Though he doesn't believe in their doctrines, but says it's okay to mingle with those who are opposed to us. That's not true. We're not to have fellowship with false doctrine. Uh, John said, if anyone brings any other doctrine, do not bid them Godspeed, nor receive them into your household. Where do people come up with this? When the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together over in the 10th chapter of Hebrews, it's talking about assembling with the like-minded believers of truth. It don't mean go down here and gather together with some Muslims or Buddhists or Baptists or Pentecostals if they don't believe God. But I had blatantly disagreed with him. I told him that it's heathen, pagan, and I can't go sit there. And for everyone to look down their noses at me, these places are clicky, which means they only socialize in little groups. Most churches here are like that. Daryl's dad told us he was very much like us when he first got saved. Got saved. Got saved. You can't get saved. Saved sozo means to be taken from one point all the way to another point and to be preserved and protected through the whole deliverance. My father used to preach, get saved. You know, it's not something you get. It's something Christ does to his elect family, isn't it? It's not something you do. It's something he does to us. It's like get. I mean, that's what John Wayne says. Now get, you know. But then the Holy Spirit showed him other things. Now, ain't that interesting? He won't stay away from us as he believes we're being misled. He calls Jim that man. <laughs> he calls Jim that man. I, I've got a T-shirt that says cult leader on the front, and it says that Jim Brown on the back because people are always saying, you still listen to that Jim Brown? That man. <laughs> they don't know. This tickles me. It makes it's funny. And Daryl can keep his cool much easier than I can. I just, I just want us, as he believes, we are being misled. He calls Jim that man. Daryl can keep his cool much easier. I just want to tell him to get out. It is so hard for me. We can see the news that the England church is going through some breaking away, and God's wrath is seen in the weather. Now, if you look at the world map and see how close we actually are to England, you will automatically think that we're getting flooded too, but this is not the case. Our weather has been relatively mild compared to what the rest of the UK are getting. When Daryl and I got married, he just started working in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Then within six months, he came home to get me and took me out there with him. This was 1993 and in 1996. Matthew was born in Al Mishari Hospital, Riyadh. Daryl picked up some of the language and was able to write some of the Arabic much easier than his co-workers. Now, we weren't Christians at this time. God never got mentioned except for scolding. When Matthew was three years old, one day he said, I'm going to be a God-man. I was completely baffled at his statement as he didn't even possess a Bible. The Saudi authorities caught you with one. You'd be in big trouble. I knew very little about what was in the Bible. I know what it is like to live in the desert with a little rain, although when it did rain, it poured. Plus, at certain times of the year, lots of locust-like creatures came and would completely cover paths and areas. Frightened me first time I saw this. I do know that if I had known then what I know now, I probably would have ended up in Chop Chop Square as I, as I can't keep my mouth shut now. Now, Jim thinks that America is a bad state, but United Kingdom is as bad. In Northern Ireland, the majority is Protestant, but only a fraction of those are churchgoers. The rest are mostly loyalists like my family are. When they say Protestant, they don't mean godly, righteous, holy people. They're talking about uh, Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, whatever. Church of England, that's what they call Protestants. These people aren't interested in God. 
as television has sorted them out with evolution, which is also taught in the schools. Christians are allowing these changes to happen. They are not taking a stand, but then there are a few Christians here. The Catholics are the minority, and like other chapel numbers, have dwindled, dwindled, and like the loyalists, they have sectarian attitude. People here love to fight, although they talk peace. There will never be peace in Northern Ireland. The Catholic Church has lost control in our country. There are loads of unmarried Catholic mums. Seems to be the norm these days. So Northern Ireland is as heathen as it gets. Daryl speaks at work. When opportunity is made, most people ignore us now because we speak truth. If there is one woman he works with has inquired to his source, so we should hear her opinion soon. She is not unlike me, never went to church, and has parents who don't believe God. I trust God will bring us like-minded to fellowship. Thank Jesus for small mercies. He shows his love when you least expect. Long message, I know. Agape, Linda. We love you, Linda. I know you're going through struggles there, and I... My heart really goes out to these people overseas and places where they don't have any truth. We love you guys there in Ireland. I wish, I hope we can get people together. I'd like to go on TV over there. Uh, I got a letter from Alexander Tate. He's seventy. Year, he's seventeen years old, almost eighteen. <laughs> he he lives in England, and I'll just read a little bit of this. Not all of it. It's hard to, hard to try to explain to you my life. I attempted to write up a big email earlier and I've spent two to three hours editing and erasing trying to work out what I want to say how I want to say it he says he was an atheist uh, he's gone through all of this he's listened to us he says anyway thank you so much Jim Brown if I were there in America I would be there every single day that you were teaching and I do not lie when I when I have said these things I have said I'm wandering around on my own searching for fellowship with Jesus' sheep that believe the whole truth and are taking up a daily cross. It's proving that the path truly is narrow. I really do hope that one day we could meet Agape Alex. I didn't read the full letter. That'll be enough of the emails. I've got several more. I've got phone calls and letters. I'll just tell you what some of the phone calls I got. I've got, uh, got a call from... Uh, Richard, some from somewhere, Lucinda Brown in Greensboro, North Carolina. She watches his own TV there. James McKenzie in Memphis, Tennessee. He watches TV there. Uh, Michael Thomas in Washington, D.C. We're on TV up there. Kevin Anderson. Uh, Kelvin Anderson, he's in North Carolina. Rosanda Stevens, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Kenneth Gibson, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Greg Swafford, Cordova, Tennessee, loves the message. Uh, Donald McKinney, Dayton, Ohio, talked to him uh, just recently. And uh, Kimberly Strong, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, let me see here, got Matt Dobson from somewhere. Uh, Louis Key, I don't know where he's from, I think it's Chicago. And then uh, got got a call from uh, Gerard Copeland, Belleville, Illinois. And I got a letter from Aline Neely. She's in Beaumont, Texas. She watches us there. John Williams, Tucson, Arizona. And got more emails. Got an email from Talene Estonia from uh, Mido Haima. And I'll uh, maybe read some of that. Sunday. I got more emails. I just don't have time to get them all. All right. Let me give you our announcements real quick. I got a few things to say tonight. And uh, remember, watch us on TV in Nashville uh, Monday night and Saturday night, 10 o'clock. And then uh, uh, we're on Wednesday morning, Friday morning at midnight, channel 176. And uh, Tuesday evening at 5, Thursday night at 7, Channel 3 in Hendersonville. And we're on uh, radio over Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. That's WNQM 1300 on the AM dial. We're also on radio down in New Orleans. We're on TV in New Orleans, all over Louisiana, all over Texas. And uh, 
and we're trying to reach people with this message. We're on the internet. You can go on our website, graceandtruth.net. I've got about 300 messages on there. And they're putting more and more on there. We got got our our one of our Revelation series we're putting on there. They're putting them on as fast as they can. We got about 236 messages on one Revelation series. That was about four and a half years on one Revelation series. And we're back into it on Sunday morning. So we've probably got 250 or 60 messages on it now. Going through every word in the book, every culture, custom, idiom, and metaphor that we can come up with. And... Uh, People wonder, where do you get all this information? I have got a magnificent library in my home. It has some of the best, I've got some of the best books. It's not so much more than other people. I've got several thousand books, but it's the best you can get for researching. And I, I love to research, research constantly. Uh, I'll recommend to you what books you need. If you want to call me, write to me, email uh, there's about 12 items that you can get. Not 12 books, but 12 items. You need a good set of commentaries. Culture of the first century. Alfred Edersheim's got four books on culture of the first century. Uh, Adolf Deisman, the, culture, the Jewish culture of the first century. Adolf deisman has got Greek culture of the first century in his books. And then good set of encyclopedias, McClinic and Strong or Hastings, or both of them if you can find them. Um, Hastings is a 13-volume set. McClinic and Strong is a 12-volume set. And, uh, and of course, you need a concordance, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. After you get that, then I'll teach you what to do with your... I, people are talking about interlinear Bible. Everybody needs to know how to use it. You can't just have an interlinear without knowing how to use it. Has anybody got interlinears here? You know how to use them. You know how to look up the word in a in a analytical lexicon then you don't know how to use it <laughs> don't say you know how <laughs> you can't use it without an analytical lexicon you got to memorize your greek alphabet what i need to do is get everybody together on a friday night at the house when we gather together and show you how to use your interlinear bible but you got to have get mr mouse's analytical lexicon this lady hadn't been here but this is a uh, this is your interlinear. It's got the Greek on the top line and right under it, the English. I don't even trust the English in the interlinear. You can't trust English at all. So you go find the word and then you look it up. You have to memorize your alphabet. And then you look it up in a lexicon. It's a, I call it a parsing guide. And you look up the word, and it'll tell you if it's a participle, an adverb, a verb, or a noun, what tense it is, the mood, and so forth. That's how you use it. And Mr. Strong's not going to do that for you. You have to go and find that. So, there's New York just walked in. Hey, New York. It's good to see y'all. <clears throat> All right. That'll be enough said on the interlinear. The people here need to learn to use their interlinears. But you have to have an interlinear, you have to have an analytical lexicon, and you need a first-year Greek student's book, and I'll show you how to look things up in that. You can get a Mr. Mason's or you get Mr. Mounts, M-O-U-N-C-E. He's very good, and uh, we need to do that. All right. Remember our needy people. We've got a bunch of needy people that are struggling. We've got some widow ladies we send gift cards to, money to, they struggle to live. And we send others, the Brigmans up in Chicago, and uh, Amanda Meadows out here in, in Murfreesboro, she's in a struggle. Another lady over in North Carolina. Huh? Oh, Laverne. She lives in Laverne. Uh, Amanda, her husband's on dialysis three times a week, and uh, she said he's going down and and nobody pays for it, but they keep treating him. And they barely, barely exist. So we send them money every month. If you want to help the needy, everything you give goes to them. You can send a gift card, a Walmart card. or This is one of the great obligations of the church is to take care of the needy believers. And that's what we're going to do. We can't pay all their bills, but we can send them $7,500 a month. And, uh, and we do that for a bunch of the folks. 
not for any glory, but this is a command of God to take care of the widows and the orphans, and we're going to do that. So uh, just uh, if you send something to the needy, put needy on it, and uh, on the bottom of your check, and it all goes into a fund for them. We believe that people that believe this truth will support it. We never ask for money for the church. And it takes a lot to run it. So uh, about our overhead is about thirty three, thirty four thousand a month for the small church that we are. And that's due to the cameras and the TV and all of this. So just uh, be aware of that. And uh, if you send something to the missionaries, put missions on the bottom of it. They're down there in a war against every kind of situation and element you can think of. All right. We're glad to see you guys got here, didn't you? Flew in from New York. Boy, are your arms tired, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's an old corny old. <laughs> this must be Sean over here. Sean, this is the first time I've seen Sean. Good to see you. And, uh, and Elton is back there. Elton was on the parking lot one night, and John was standing right next to him. I said, Elton John's here tonight. <laughs> Right? <clears throat> All right. We've been really fortunate. To, uh, what? Well, I said Elton and John. Elton John's here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. In his name, amen. We're glad to have uh, Virginia, right? Ferguson here her husband her brother is an attorney across the street i've known his huh tim husband your husband is tim oh i can't get this right husband's tim that was carl's carl oldham's partner and uh, i've known carl for about 40 years just found out a while ago he passed away yep he is i like carl <clears throat> I used to go by and preach to him all the time. Huh? He was a month older than me, I think, Carl was. A month older, yeah. <clears throat> I've known Carl about 35 years, I think. It's Wednesday night, and we're teaching through the Old Testament every other Wednesday night. Sunday morning, we're, te we're back on the book of Revelation. Sunday night, we're in the doctrine of the devil. That's what we're teaching on. Uh, on every other Wednesday night, we're teaching on the off Wednesday nights. We're teaching on predestination and atonement, and it's being intermingled with a bunch of other doctrines as well. We went through the book of Genesis, took about two and a half years to go through Genesis, went through every character, every event, every happening, every person, went through things that people wouldn't think of us going through. And then we got into Exodus. <clears throat> in the first chapter of Exodus, we find that uh, Israel is put over there in Egypt. They're put into bondage. And they're in bondage for 400 years. Moses comes on the scene. He's birthed in the second chapter of Exodus. And then he goes before God. He talks to God in the mountain out of the fiery bush. And the bush is not consumed in that third chapter. And then he goes, he's commanded by God to go to Pharaoh and to tell Pharaoh to let Israel go. But he says, I'm going to, God says, I'm going to take judgments upon Pharaoh and I'm going to cause him to be willing to let Israel go. I'm going to harden his heart and he will not let the people go until we get to the 10th chapter. Judgment. The tenth judgment is the death of the firstborn in Egypt. That's in the twelfth chapter of Exodus. That's in, uh, in the twelfth chapter of Exodus is the Passover. The Passover is the death of the firstborn. Passover. 
And the Passover was before the law. The law doesn't come till 40 years later. Uh, excuse me. The law, the Passover is here before the law, but the law is here as they leave Egypt. It comes not 40 years, 40 days up on the mountain, 40 days on the mountain. They're in the desert 40 years. Takes 10 days to get it, get to the mountain in Sinai or Horeb, which is another name for Sinai. So whenever you find Horeb, it's the same as Sinai. And they go into the desert. They're 10 days into the desert. This happens in Exodus 12. They go into the desert. So 50 days from the Passover, Moses receives the law. Well, what is 50 days after the Passover? Pentecost. Pent is the word five. The first Pentecost was when Moses came down and he had the law in his hand. And that was the birth of literal Israel, like Acts 2 is the birth of spiritual Israel at this Pentecost. Acts 2, you had a Pentecost every year. You had, you had the festivals, the three main festivals of the year was Passover, Pentecost, Pentecost, and the, and the Feast of Ingathering, which was the final harvest, Feast of Ingathering. And that was coupled with the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. And the Feast of Ingathering had a couple other titles. It was called the Feast, the Feast of Huts, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Huts, or Feast of Tabernacles. And that was to commemorate their time in the wilderness when they lived in tents. When they lived in tents. And this first feast was on Nisan, Nisan 14. That was the day of the week. They brought the lamb, the Passover lamb, into the house on Nisan 10. And they inspected the lamb for four days. And then they would take it to the priest. Everyone in the house would take it to the priest. One of the priests at the temple... They could take it over here to the temple. And here's the temple. There's the veil. Here's the Ark of the Covenant. There's the table of showbread. We don't know what they're shaped like. Nobody knows. Uh, the altar of incense and the seven candlesticks. Solomon's porch out here. The altar, the brazen altar, the brazen sea. And they would take it to one of the priests and he would inspect it by the altar. We don't know whether he inspected over here, over here, over here, over here. But he would inspect it, and then he would look through it, and if it had no blemishes, which was a type of Christ not having any sin, he would pronounce these words over the Passover lamb, and there would be hundreds of thousands of them killed. They'd, uh, 15 to 17, 18 people would eat off of one lamb in each household. And they would gather on that day in their households, and they would celebrate this Passover that they, when they left Egypt. Well, the priest would look through the lamb. If he couldn't find any blemishes, he would say, I find no fault in him. Those are the words that Pilate pronounced over the true Passover lamb, which is Christ. I find no sin in him. He would slit the throat of the lamb, catch it in a basin, and sling it against that altar. And that's what the Passover lamb wanted, and that was Christ. Everything over here in the Old Testament is a shadow. Hebrews 10 and 1, the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image over here is the image image this is the shadow skia shade when you cast a shadow you cast a shade the shade is not the real the image is the real over here you had passover so we have to have a spiritual passover over here spiritual passover spiritual passover Spiritual Pentecost, spiritual Day of Atonement. We go into all of these. I've gone through them. You've heard me go through them. We're talking about the Passover, which was the tenth plague. It was the last plague where God softened faith. It was God that softened his heart because it was God that hardened his heart. So we're talking about the spiritual Passover. We know what the Passover was over here. We find it the first one that comes up 
It was before the law, but it was implemented into the law. Just like the tithe was before the law in the 14th chapter of Genesis, but the tithe was implemented into the law. That's what we're supposed to be doing to supply the work of God. Now, I am teaching on something that I've never heard another preacher in the world in my life teach on. I've been, bear with me in my folly, and D, bear with me, like Paul said. I, I don't mean to speak in a boast, but I speak foolishly. I have been a um, mathematician of sorts all my life. I like Mike. I don't have his education in math, but I always think of things in the Bible mathematically. If it doesn't add up, it's not true. I don't care how many commentaries men have. When you're reading a book, you have to learn to read. I've been a reader since I was a little boy. You have to learn to read the the information out of a book and exegete the information and leave the man's opinion there. If he says, i.e., that may be true, that may not be true. That is to say, it may be true, it may not. You have to use the Bible as a backdrop. And screen everything against the Bible. I don't go along with somebody because they're an authority. I love the McClinic and Strong Encyclopedia. I love the Hastings over there, but I don't always agree with them. You need to understand something. When you're reading an encyclopedia, there may be 450 or 500 contributors to that encyclopedia. Does that mean that I'm going to agree just because this is an official religious set of books, I'm going to agree with every one of those contributors in that? No, that doesn't mean that. I was reading along in McClinic and Strong, and they said, and I love these encyclopedias, and they made the statement. They said, uh, such and such believes the absurdity that so-and-so. And I said, yeah, and Jim Brown believes that too. And you have to learn to read the Scripture. This is our final authority right here. The Bible is our final authority. These men are not inspired, but the, always look at information, not their inspiration. If you, if you gave me a choice of books to read. If you told me you can have a book on information or get some of these books that are really inspiring by Bunyan and by Luther, I'll take the information every time because I've got just as much sense as Luther had to be able to exegete the Scripture and see what it says according to information, historical information, uh, information about the culture, the customs, the idioms, the metaphors. I've got just as much sense as they had. And you have to remember, if you're reading Luther, which he was a great scholar, or if you're reading John Bunyan, he wrote probably the most famous book besides the Bible in the last 2,000 years, that was Pilgrim's Progress. You can read Bunyan's works. He's, he was a Puritan. He was a wonderful man. But it doesn't mean these guys have all the answers. Don't always think that. And that is no put down to them. I love Mr. Edersheim, but I don't believe that he had all the answers. You have to be very analytical when studying the Bible. Now, we're, I've spent a lot of time doing this. We're talking about a spiritual Passover. What men have done, they have taken this Passover over here. And it's brought into effect, it's brought into play in the New Testament. We see it in the New Testament in, in uh, four particular chapters in the New Testament. We see the Passover the last literal Passover. We see it in Matthew 26. Now, this is the night before Jesus died. When I say the night before Jesus died, it was actually the same day that Jesus died because the Jews said their day began at 6 o'clock in the evening and ended at 6 o'clock the next evening. Jesus was taken on a Friday night, excuse me, on Thursday, excuse me. Well, it was Thursday night, what they were eating, what we would call Thursday night. Thursday night. Sometime this would be our Thursday night. Here's our midnight come Thursday night. It would be actually be Friday morning, midnight. He was taken sometime between 9 and 12, sometime between 9 to 12, sometime during that time period, he was taken by the Roman soldiers. 
He was eating the Passover earlier that night. Since he was crucified somewhere around 12 o'clock, the next day, it's not the next day to them. It's the same day to them since when the Bible says in Genesis, the first chapter, the evening and the morning was the first day. The Jews reckon their days by that scripture. They said that their day began at, at six or sundown, sundown actually. Six o'clock was about sundown to them. And it ended at sundown the next day. So when he is taken somewhere between 9, uh, nine to 12, the, what we would call the night before, because our day begins at 12 o'clock midnight, right there. Forget 12 o'clock midnight. That has nothing to do with their calendar. He was taken here, and the same day, during the daylight part of that day, he was crucified somewhere around 12 o'clock because there was darkness from the 6th to the ninth hour. They had a daylight day. Their daylight day began at 6 in the morning and ended at 6 in the evening. And the, the first hour of the day was 6 to 7. They said the sixth hour of the day was noon, and the ninth hour of the day was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So when there was darkness from the 6th to the ninth hour, there was darkness from 12 noon until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So he dies somewhere around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, somewhere in that neighborhood. He has to be in the grave before sundown because it was against Jewish law to have a man hanging on a cross on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath began at 6 o'clock, and that's why they went around to break his legs. Now I'll go back into that later. They break his legs so that he couldn't breathe on that cross, and we'll... We'll lay the cross out. But what I want us to do is go back to those verses that people use. And what they've done, they've taken this Passover and they've turned the Passover into what they call communion. I call it crackers and grape juice. Crackers and grape juice. That's what I call it. Because we don't do that here. That is not what Jesus was saying to do. Now let's go back to the 26th chapter of Matthew. I'm not going to spend time in it because I spent time last week in it. I'm going to move through this real quick just to show you. Now, Jesus, this is the night before he dies. Well, if he dies, if he's dying in Matthew 26, if he's having the last Passover in Matthew 26, in Mark 14, and in Luke 22, and in John 13, if he's having the last night of his life before he's crucified, what we would call that next day, but the same day to them, if, if he was having his last night, then he's fixing to resurrect on that following Sunday morning, isn't he? So we're at the very end of the Gospels here. When you're talking about, if you forget where the last Passover is, where they call, where they uh, talk about crackers and grape juice, Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. If you forget where that is, just go to the back, go to the end of the Gospels, because that's right before he resurrects, isn't he? You understand what I said? If you forget where that is. Now, let's go back over here to Matthew 26. Now, I like to emphasize what they were eating. They were not eating communion. Where does this communion come from? It was a ritual that came about in the middle of, or at the end, actually, of the second century. Now, look here in Matthew 26. I'm going to read quickly through it. This is the night of the last Passover. It's not the night of communion. I don't believe in that. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. I do not believe that the figures add up. Now look here. In verse 2, chapter 26, you know that the days of the feast of the Passover and, and the Son of Man is to be trained to be crucified. Verse 17, last sentence, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Verse 18, last sentence, my time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Verse 19, the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. 
Now, what are they about to eat? The Passover. Then you go on down here, and he says, verse 26, as they were eating what? Crackers and grape juice? Communion? As they were eating the Passover, as they were eating the Passover, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. What does it mean to do to eat? It doesn't mean to always put something in your mouth and chew on it, does it? Jesus tell the apostles in John 4, talking to the woman at the well of Samaria, I have a meat to eat of that you don't know of. It is to do the will of my Father. That's my meat. Meat is not necessarily something you chew on and digest. He said, I have a meat to eat of. He said, this bread, he said, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. What is the bread of Christ? He said that he was the bread of life, and he also said that we are the bread because we eat of him, we eat the bread. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. We being many are one bread and one body. We're the bread, we're the body. When he says partake of the body here, he says this bread is my body, didn't he? How many bodies are there, Ephesians 4 and 5? There is one body, look at it, Ephesians 4 and 5, look at it, Ephesians 4, verse 5, there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called of one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it's blood, it's not water, if there's one body, what's the body, Colossians 1, Colossians 1, Colossians 1, verse 18. He is the head of the one body, the church. Isn't that what it says? Well, it doesn't say one, but we've already established there's one body. So you can put one there. He's the head of the one body, which is the church. If he says, look here. Let me show you a little bit of algebra here. If the church is the body is body, let's just say the church equals the body, right? And there's one body, one body, and he says, Jesus says, take, eat. Now remember, to eat is something doesn't mean to chew it. Take, eat, this is my body, this is my body. There's an axiom in algebra that says you can substitute equals for equals and the results are equal. You can take this word body when Jesus says in Matthew 26 and you can substitute an equal for it. What is equal to the body? The church? He says, take, eat, this is my, substitute equals for equals, this is my church. Isn't that what he's saying? He's, he is commanding us to partake in the church, which is the body. Isn't he the head of the body according to the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians? Aren't we the church, the wife, the bride of Christ, the body? He's not talking about eating crackers here. He's talking about partaking of the body of the church. Then he says down here in verse 24 of Colossians 1, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in the flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. If there's one body and he's saying, partake of my body, he's not talking about eating bread. What is he doing holding a piece of bread up? It's a contract. The contracts of the Jews in the first century, they would act out. They would act out the contract. When real estate, we call it performing a contract. That's actually what they did. You have what's called in real estate, I sold real estate for years. It's called specific performance. That means what is agreed by the buyer and what's agreed by the seller has to be performed exactly, and then the contract is fulfilled. They actually performed their contracts. They acted them out. 
the Lord tells Ezekiel, lay on your side 40 days for this cause. Now lay on your side 40 days for this cause. Set some tiles in front of you and knock them down. This is a contract to Israel. He tells, Jeremiah tells a prophet, take this stone, wrap this book around it, throw it in the Nile, and he says, throw it in the Euphrates, and so shall Babylon sink there in that 51st chapter of, of Jeremiah. They acted out their contracts. He tells Jeremiah, he tells Ezekiel, cut some of your hair off, blow it into the fire, throw it in the fire, burn it up and say, this is what's going to happen to Israel for their apostasy. They acted out their contracts. They would always exchange a piece of clothing in this acting out the contract. Now go over here to 1 Corinthians 12. We're still talking about the one body, partaking of my body. 1 Corinthians 12. I, I have struggled with this. I struggled with this all, all my life. As a young kid back in the early 50s, it really disturbed me, them passing around crackers and grape juice and saying, this is what Jesus was saying, and I never could get what they were trying to get at. I just couldn't get a hold of it. What do you, I don't feel nothing doing this. I don't feel like I'm doing anything spiritual doing this. Look here in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, how do we partake of the body? He tells us right here. Now, what they would do, they would pass a piece of clothing at every one of the contracts. That Even if you go into Israel right now, if you go into a shop and you make a deal with some guy and he sells you something, he wants to go buy you some food, he wants to give you something. This is a common practice among a bunch of Israelites even today, and they've done this through the centuries. When you make a deal with somebody, they want to give you something back. That's what they would do in their contracts. Here's what the, there was a piece of clothing in the first century would be passed between contracts. Now, here's the clothing. Look. Look here in 1 first, first Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body is one, and how many bodies are there? There's one. And as hath many members... And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now remember, recall, 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Always identify the body with the bread because Jesus did, didn't he? When he said, this bread is my body. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says, we being many are one bread and one body. That's what he said. 10, 17. Keep these things in mind. Write them down. Then he says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, if we're baptized into one body, baptized doesn't mean to dip in water. It don't mean to sprinkle water. Remember, baptized comes from the word baptizo and bapto. These two Greek words were incorporated into our word baptize. Where did we get our word baptize? Is that an English word? No, absolutely not. It is not an English word. It was a created word. It was a created English word. It is a Greek word. Your best Greek scholars, Girdlestone, will tell you. It was impossible to translate the words baptizo and bapto in the first century. These two words incorporated in the first century was a dyer's term. It was a term that women used daily in their household to stain and dye clothes. It had a dual meaning. It was untranslatable. If it had meant to immerse, they would have translated immerse. If it had meant to sprinkle, they would have translated that. It did not mean that. So what they did, the anglicized the word Anglo is our word English. They turned these two words into an English word. Baptizo means to cover. Bapto means to stain and to die. Now, if we're baptized into one body, we're blood baptized, and a blood baptism in the first century was a martyrdom. We got our word martus from the word martyr, and that is the word witness. Witness. So when you witness, 
And you tell people Christmas is Christ's mass, it's Roman Catholicism. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. Uh, that's the truth. Constantine brought it in the church. He was trying to amalgamate the, the tree and the fire worship of the pagans with Christianity because he's about to lose the empire to the Vandals and the Visigoths and the Goths and the Huns and the, and the Gauls and the list goes on and on. And it, so he says, I'll amalgamate their gods. Well, you tell people that and you'll become blood baptized. The night before Jesus died, in Mark the 10th chapter, Jesus asked James and John, can you be baptized with a baptism I'm baptized with? He's not saying, are you able to be dipped in water? That's not what he's saying. Can you die the death? That's what he's saying. They said, yes, we can. And he said, you'll both die the martyr's death. What in the world do people think he's asking there? Are you able to be dipped in H2O? That's not what he's saying. If there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that's the clothing and the contract. Look over here. Look over here in. Well, let's read the rest of this and then I'll go to the clothing. For the body is not one member of many. And then he goes into a literal body. He says, we're one body, but many members. You got hands, you got feet, you got eyes, you got ears. But everybody can't be the eye, and everybody can't be the hand, and everybody can't be the preacher, and everybody can't be the song leader, and everybody can't be the piano player, and everybody can't be the whatever. If everybody's chiefs, we got no Indians, do we? Got no tribe. He says, if the foot shall say, because I'm not of the hand, am I not of the one body that I'm supposed to partake of? The partaking of the body is partaking as it's speaking here. And if the foot shall say, because I'm not of the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not of the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole one body, which is the bread, right? What if I just stopped and said that along the way? If the whole body, which is the bread, which is the church, were an eye, how are you going to hear if everybody's an eye? He's trying to say you have a place, you've already been placed in the body of Christ to partake of it. If the whole were a hearing, how are you going to smell? If everybody's the preacher, who's going to clean up the church? If everybody's the preacher, who's going to run the cameras? If everybody's the preacher, who's going to do all the computer work? If everybody's the preacher, Who's going to get on the phone like Dave does? If everybody's the preacher, who's going to do all the taping like Mike does? If everybody's a preacher, who's going to do the secretary like Mary does? If everybody's a preacher, who's going to... Everybody's got a place in the body. And then he says, where's the smelling? But verse 18 tells you how you partake in the body. You, you partake by the way God placed us in the body. And we've been placed with whatever gifts or abilities we have to partake. Now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the one body, the one bread, the one church, as it hath pleased him. Right? So you've already been placed in the body to partake, and you're commanded to take heat. This is my body. This is the church. Why men don't see this? I don't know. Why pre I've never, I've traveled all over America and preached in hundreds of churches, I never ran across a preacher who had the slightest inkling that this is what this is about. And he says down here, I'm not going to read the rest of this. I've gone through it. He says we give more honor to the uncomely parts of the body of Christ. They don't fit very well, the feeble parts. And he says down here, here's how you partake. Look down here in verse 27. Now ye are the one body, the bread, the church. Can I say that? Can I say you are the one body, the bread, the church? Is that okay? Because it's all the same thing, isn't it? And the bread is the body, and we being many are one. I'm going to repeat that over and over. We being many are one bread, one body. Can we get that? The one body is equal to the bread, is equal to the church, is equal to the flesh. How many times have we gone through that? And he says in verse 27, Now ye are the one body, the bread, the church of Christ, and members in particular. The word particular is the word meros. It means a portion 
to partake or to eat of. We're going to end on a preposition, okay? Is that all right? A portion either. Look over here in Luke 24. In Luke 24. Luke 24. Now, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He comes to the apostles. They're fishing. And he asks them a question. All right. Luke 24. <clears throat> and he comes to them. And as, verse 36, as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. And said to them, he's in his resurrected body, peace be unto you. And they were terrified and affrighted. I guess so. He just died and now he's resurrected. They just seen him. And suppose that he had been seen as been a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that is, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed him his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, I'm hungry. Do you have anything to eat? Have you any meat? And look what they give him. And they gave him a maros, a piece of fish. The word maros and the word particular of the exact same word we're members in particular we are eating partaking of the body of christ you see that that's very simple now oh by the way if you don't partake of the maros you place the alpha in front of maros the first letter of the greek alphabet the alpha primitive And that negates the word, just like asexual, atypical. Place the alpha in front of meros, it translates H. There's no H's in the Greek, there's the H sound. Ha. A-M-A-R-T-I-A. Hamartia is the word sin. If you don't eat of the body of Christ, you partake of sin. That's amazing. Now. What is the, we're baptized into the body, blood baptized. You're not water baptized into the body of Christ. Yeah. Look over here in Galatians 3. Galatians 3, and then we'll go to, I, in a contract, in a contract there was always a piece of clothing transferred to show the, the sincerity on the part. Now, look at Galatians 3, verse 27. Here is the clothing in the contract that Jesus is making. Galatians 3, 27. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, isn't there? A blood baptism was a death. Jesus said in the 12th chapter of Luke, I have a baptism to be baptized with. He had already been washed in water. That was a proselyte baptism. Not going to go there right now. He said, I have one in the future to be baptized with. How am I straightened, held together till it be accomplished? He's talking about his death on the cross. We have a daily death. That's a daily cross. And that's our blood baptism. And he says here, for as many as, he says, for as many of you, verse 27, as have been baptized into Christ. He said we're baptized into one body, didn't he? That's the church. That's not water. That is blood. As many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's the clothing. Look here. Put on is the word in duo. It means to sink into clothing aha we put on christ when we sink into clothing there's the contract there's the cloth 
when you study the Jewish culture, they passed a piece of clothing in the contract. And when Jesus said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, testament is the word diatheke. Diatheke means last will and testament. And that was a contract that God required us to keep and to fulfill. It's the last will and testament. Now, he says, as many of you have been baptized in Christ. Now, let me show you something with that. Go to Matthew 28. If you'll notice how baptism, we don't believe in water baptism here. We don't believe in passing around crackers and grape juice. That's not what Jesus was saying. What happened to all those old rituals? What happened to them? Colossians 2.14. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Not the law. Do we make void the law through faith? Yea, we establish the law. The law is still here, isn't it? We establish the law. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Galatians 5, 14. Romans 13 and 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, for love is the fulfilling of the law. And love is agape, and that's walking in the God's commandments. Is it walking in God's commandments fulfilling the law? I guess it would be, wouldn't it? If you don't run traffic lights, you're fulfilling the law. Don't rob curb markets, you're fulfilling the law, right? Now, look here in Matthew 28. Matthew, now this goes with baptized into Christ. This is the clothing, the clothing of the contract. Look here in Matthew 28. Here's what men call the Great Commission. I am... Where I differ with preachers, I believe the Old Testament is the picture of everything in the New. This is an equation. I mean, being a mathematician, I love equations. I mean, I'm in love with equations. They're all through the Scriptures. The Old Testament equals the New. The Old Testament is the shadow, and it equals everything over here. We know, we know that the seven churches of Asia are the seven candlesticks, and that's inside the outer sanctuary. And seven is the number of divine refinement. We know that we're the bread. We know the prayers of the saints is the altar of incense. We know that in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. And we know that the law is written on tables of stone in the Old Testament. And that's written on fleshy tables of our hearts in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians, isn't it? We know that the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled. Now we know our hearts are sprinkled. We know we're elected unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood. Doesn't this make sense? All the sense in the world, we know that we're washed in the blood of Christ, and we know we have a daily altar, which is the daily cross, and I can go into that in greater detail. Look here in Matthew 28. Galatians 3.27 goes with this. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. It's the same situation as we find in the 24th chapter of Luke. And he comes and appears to his 11 disciples, or his 11, the 11, uh, one's dead, that's Judas. When they get to, when they get to Pentecost, which is going to be right at 50 days from this point, he's going to be seen of his apostles 40 days. And when he gets to Pentecost, they're going to add Matthias with them. He'll be the 12th to take Judas' place. So he meets with the 11, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. But when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in. Boy, that is a powerful word, in. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That word in is going to connect with Galatians 3.27. It's going to connect with, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on. That word put on in duo. In duo. Galatians 3.27 is going to equal this word in. Let me show you why. By definition of the word in. You got three words in the Greek that are used with the word baptized. 
you have the word is, in, and epi. These three. Every time you find the word baptized in, if you're in Acts 2.38, when Peter commands those, they, they're cut to the heart, and he says, repent and be baptized in the name. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then over there in Acts, Acts 10, 48, when he commands them to be baptized in the name. Not one of those names, not one of those words in means to move into a fluid and come out of it. This one right here, this one right here, when he commands them to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, that word there is the word es. It's the word es. Matthew, in Matthew 28, 19. He's, that word is es. It means to sink into. It means sink into, but it doesn't mean to come out. Enduo means to sink into clothing. So that word enduo in Galatians 3, 27 is going to equal this word here in Matthew 28, 19. East to sink into but not come out of. In Acts 2.38, when Peter commands them to be baptized in the name, that word is the word epi, and it means to be covered with or superimpose the name. And then over there in Acts 10.48, when Peter's at the house of Cornelius, and he commands them to be baptized in the name, Acts 10.48, 10, 48. That word in is E-N or E-N. It's E-N or E-N. To be baptized. This is Acts 10, 48. To be baptized is not a verb. It's a noun. It's an infinitive an infinitive in the Greek is always a verbal noun. It has verbal character. It's a verbal noun. Verbal character. It's never anything else. This is a noun with verbal character. It has the idea, if you have a barn, you're going to paint it red, and somebody's splashing the paint from some source. Or you're down here at the side kneeling down, and you're splashing the paint on the barn. You don't take the barn and dip it down into the paint. The movement is coming from an outer source, and baptized means to cover with a stain or dye, and any time you use the word en with an infinitive, in the Greek it means with or by. That's all. Never means into or out of. It means to be baptized with the name. Name is the word onoma. Onoma means authority. What is God's authority? His word. His word. Thy word is truth. The spirit is truth. John 14, 15, 16. John 15, 26. John 16, 13. The spirit is the truth. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. And God's authority is his word. We're baptized with the Spirit, which is the truth, which is the Word of God, which is God's authority. And it's spread, and it's spread upon us. What is this clothing? Look at Revelation, the first chapter. <clears throat> Revelation 1. Didn't mean to get here, but here I am. You can't even teach the ritual without the baptism and the crackers and grape juice have to go together. Or the so-called communion. Now look here in Revelation, the first chapter. All right. We're looking at the clothing of the contract, right? All right. Revelation 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed, luo, L-O-U-O, he did the washing. We don't do the washing. He's doing the washing. 
It's by the washing of regeneration he saved us. We're not talking about a washing in literal water, H2O. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul? Are you dying the death? You see, if you're washed in the blood, you're going to take your cross and die daily. Because Jesus said, if you do not bear your cross and follow after me in Luke 14, 27, you cannot be my disciple. We have to, this is the clothing. Let's make sure this is the clothing. Go to Revelation 7. Revelation 7. <clears throat> now, this is talking about all those that are gathered around the throne of God, and I don't have time to go into the throne. That's the Ark of the Covenant. We know that. Look at verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Notice the white robes. All of the priests wore white linen garments when they were going to do sacrifice. White is the color of righteousness. White robes are the color of righteousness all through Scripture with palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these? which are arrayed in white robes, in which came they. Remember, an article of clothing among the Jews was exchanged. Here's the white robes. And he said unto me, Sir, I do not know. And he said to him, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of Christ, in a blood baptism. In a blood baptism, we're baptized into the one body. Isn't that correct? If we're baptized into the one body, then the clothing exchange is the blood of Christ that he sprinkles upon us. We don't do the sprinkling. We're elected to obedience and the sprinkling of his blood. And that's the true baptism. And that's the clothing that we're given in this contract. Can you see that? It's not that hard, but if you insist on water, dipping people in water, and you insist on passing around crackers and grape juice, you're not going to get this. So go, let's go back to Matthew 26. And let's see, I want to recall to you something we've learned. Go to Matthew, back to Matthew 26. So the clothing in the contract is going to be the blood baptism, isn't it? And that's what Jesus is asking James and John. Can you be baptized with this baptism? That's what he's saying. Look at Luke 12 on the way over there. You've you got to see this. Maybe if you'll read it, it'll mean more to you. Luke 12. <clears throat> Verse 49. I am come to send fire on earth, and what will I if it be kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. This is long after. This is long after he has been washed in water. What happened to the water? It was nailed to the cross with Christ. And how am I straightened? Soon echo. Held together until it be accomplished. How am I held together until this, this death on the cross is going to be accomplished? And we have to take our cross and die daily, don't we? So, this blood baptism is the clothing that's passed back and forth. I don't believe in dipping. What happened to that? Back to Colossians, I'll have to go ahead and give it to you in this. Colossians 2. Colossians 2. I'll have to go ahead and give you something about proselyte baptism. I'll just go ahead and do that in this because this is in the series. All right, now, if a man was going to come to Israel and be a member of Israel, the kingdom of God, Israel, another title for Israel was kingdom of God. If a man's coming to Israel and going to be a member of the kingdom of God, if he was coming, let's say, from Athens, he's over there in Greece, and he knows Grecian culture, and he's got his home and family there, and he hears about this God of Israel, and he wants to come from Athens over here to Israel and become 
a member of Israel. They had a proselyte process. They had to be circumcised, washed in water, in water, and they call that a new birth. What they call it. And then they had to offer two young pigeons or two turtle doves. And that was a prescribed sacrifice right here. After the woman set, was set aside for 40 days, Mary came to the temple there in Luke, the second chapter, and it looked at the first chapter. And she, after her days of purification, she came to the temple to offer the two turtle doves as a sacrifice for Christ who had been born. That was Jewish law. And that wasn't nailed to the cross till he died. So, this is what they had to do. This was required in Israel. This was required in Israel. This, this proselyte process, proselyte process was implemented in, among the Jews by the Pharisees, which were the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. And this was called a tradition of the Jews. That word tradition is the word paradosis. It means the traditionary mosaic law. Not the mosaic law. Traditionary mosaic law. This is why Jesus attacked Israel was over the traditionary. This is why he attacked the Pharisees over the traditionary mosaic law. Just very quickly, when Israel was a nation for 500 years, 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, God told them if you keep going after idols, they went after Baal, Grove, Shemosh, Molech. These were all the gods of the fire and tree goddesses. Same system that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ Mass. Don't have time to go over there. It's just take me all night long, all day tomorrow. They kept going after it, and he says, what I'll do, I'll scatter you. I'll send sword, famine, pestilence. Then I'll send the beast. That'll be Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Babylon carried southern Judah away into captivity. They end up over here in Babylon. They need a way of worship, so they start what they call synagogue. They need the law, so they bring the law from Israel. I'm just going to pretend it's over here, and they don't have it over there. Kind of make it clear to you. They bring it from Israel. They say they got 613 laws in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's what they call Torah. We call it Pentateuch. Call it Pentateuch. They translate this law, the translation of the law, from Hebrew to Aramaic. And you cannot translate something from one language to another without it having a loss of meaning. And that's what happened. Not only did they have a loss, they intentionally twisted the law, and that, that translation was called Targum. It went through a process. Instead of having high priests like they had over here, and a priesthood, and Levites like they had in Israel, they had rabbis over here. Rabbis. And when they were over here, they said, we'll bring this law over, and they twisted it in what they called halakha and Haggadah. And I'm going to go through this on Sunday night more. And the halakha was a verbal law, and it could not be written down. And Haggadah was a written law, and it could not be spoken out loud. And this went through an evolutionary process over hundreds of years from the building, beginning of the building of the temple in Babylon. They started rebuilding the temple in 538 B.C. under a decree given by Cyrus. And they went back to Israel and started building it. But the rabbis had this in, and they became the Pharisees hundreds of years later in Israel. Rabbi means master or teacher. And this is what the Pharisees were teaching, the Halakha. It evolved into what was later on called Mishnah, 
It had several titles, Mishnah or Midrash, and you had many other. You had uh, Gamera, uh, which was an addition. It was another title for Talmud. And that's a twisted. This is a twisting of the Word of God is what it is. Well, in the Halakha, the Pharisees would implement all these things, and they took that, they took the washing of the priesthood every day from this brazen sea, implemented it into this, this proselyte washing. Number one was a requirement for every Jew in Israel. Number three was a requirement for every Jew in Israel. This was their tradition, and they said everyone has to go through this, and if you're a proselyte, you're a Gentile going to come to Israel, you had to go through that. Well, <clears throat> Where do I want to go here? Jesus was in northern... The Pharisees knew that he was from Nazareth. Southern Judah had come back from the captivity under the laws of the Persians when Israel was in the captivity. Only southern Judah came back. The Pharisees in southern Judah or in Jerusalem hated northern Israel, which they called Samaria, because they said they were corrupted with the... With the, with the uh, religion of the Assyrians who had come in and conquered them in 722 B.C. and they had brought their laws in and northern Israel had mixed their Jewish religion with Assyrian religion. That's why the Pharisees hated them. And since Jesus was from Nazareth, which was the septic tank of the world as far as the Pharisees was concerned, it was filth. Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Jesus said, Behold a man in whom is no guile. He'll tell you exactly what he thinks. But see, Jesus wasn't going to convince the Pharisees that he was from southern Judah. He wasn't going to tell them he was born in Bethlehem. I'm not going to tell you nothing. I'm not here to prove anything to you vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And the Pharisees kept calling him, He's a Samaritan. That's what they called him. Because he was from Samaria. He was raised in Samaria. He was born in Judah. He's the king of Israel. He ain't going to prove that to them. But they had this proselyte process. He said, since they have taken the washing of the priesthood and implemented it into their process, and since I haven't died yet and nailed that to the cross yet, this is fine. I'll be washed in water. They had in their halakha, they said, if a man was a foreign, if he was from another country, if he was a wise man, and if he would go through this process, he, their halakha said they had to listen to him. All he has to do, and there's nothing against God's law for him being washed in water because he was the priest of God. So he has John the Baptist washing. He wasn't washed to give us an example. I'll show you exactly why he's washed. Go to John, the first chapter. John will tell you exactly why he's washed. I don't even know anybody that even understands this except the people of grace and truth. And why? I, sometimes I am such a nobody. I don't know why he lets me see it. But I know this is true. I'll die for this belief. Look here. Here's exactly why Jesus was washed in water. They call him a Samaritan in John 8. They said he hath a devil. He cast out devils by Beelzebub. If he's washed in water, he's already been circumcised. Eighth day, all the males had to be circumcised. Jesus was circumcised. His mother offered two turtle doves. If he's washed in water, they're going to have to listen to him. Aren't they? According to their halakha, they are. Look at John 1. <clears throat> I love this. I don't know about y'all. I love this. It is fantastic to me. John's the first chapter. Jesus is coming to John. John, they ask, well, I'm not going to go into all this. It'll take me too much time. Look at verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, saith, Behold, the Passover Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world which taketh away the sin of the world. 
this is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he that was before me, I knew him not. But here's why he was washed in water. But that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come washing in water. That's the only reason he was washed. They would have to listen to him. It was their tradition, their halakha. That's why he's washed. But what happened to that, all of those rituals of the Jews? Colossians 2, look at it. Colossians 2. Boy, I love this. this. I, I started to say I wish preachers could see it. No, I don't. I want God whatever God wants. If, they, if he wants a blind, I want a blind. Now look here. Look at verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you. Sulagogeo. Take you off into captivity. Take a spoil. Pick you up and carry you back into darkness. He says, this is what will get you in darkness. Here's what will get you in darkness through philosophy. Philos Sophia. Philos. Philosophos. From Philos, a fondness for Sophos. Get the word Sophia from that. It's a woman's name. It means wisdom. They love their own wisdom through philosophy and vain, empty deception after the traditions of men, after the paradosis, halakha, Ritual. The next phrase says ritual. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world. The word rudiment is the word stoichion. The Jews called all of their rituals of the temple stoichion. The only arrangement of the rituals. He says rituals will lead you away into captivity. Then go on and look what he says. For in Christ dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything is complete in Him. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of the principality and power. Now look at verse 11. Who are we talking to? A Colossian Gentile church, right? Colossian church? Are they Gentiles? Before Jesus died, Colossians 2.14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Blotting out the rituals, which was contrary to us. Took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. When you did away with one contract, you took the contracting parties, the two contractors, took them out in public. You took the witnesses, took two witnesses to verify everything under Jewish law. You said, is everybody in agreement? We're going to invalidate this contract. They'd say, yes, you drive a nail through it. We take a notary stamp. And that held up in their courts of law. Blotting out the handwriting of rituals. All the rituals are blotted out. That's this chapter right here in verse 14. But notice what he says right before it. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Not this anymore. And notice what he says after that. In their proselyte process, and we're talking to Gentiles, aren't we? In their proselyte process, they circumcised first. And they didn't realize that the circumcision wouldn't be harmed by water. But they'd say, we'll wait till it heals and then we'll wash them in water. Notice what he says next. Buried with him in baptism. If the circumcision is made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, what makes you think this buried with him in baptism is literal? You can't add apples and oranges like my arithmetic teacher used to say, can you? You can't have a spiritual circumcision and a literal baptism, can you? No, he's talking about that proselyte baptism has been blotted out. That was the water. In fact, that's what Peter said in 
Acts 10, 47. He, he didn't say, can any forbid water that they should be baptized? It says in the original text, not the water forbid. Lest these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. They need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not with water. That's what Peter was saying. It doesn't say in the text what these Baptist preacher friends of my father would say when I was a kid. And what he would say. Doesn't say, can any forbid water. Does not say that in the original Greek text. It says, not the water forbid. And a forbid is not even a verb. It's an infinitive. It means a dam that you put up, a D-A-M. It's like saying, not the water, dam. It's a noun with a verbal character. The word forbid is not, in our, in our English, who can forbid water? That's a verb, if you read it the way it says in English, but it's not that in the Greek. I don't know why nobody ever looks at this, but they don't. And he says, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, Colossian Gentile church, if this had happened before, this is written somewhere around 50 A.D. If this had happened before Jesus died, they would have had to go through this. But they're even saying this. Paul is saying to Amir, this is out. This is out. Isn't that what he's saying? You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him? You don't have to be circumcised anymore like the circumcision that God gave to Abraham. In Genesis, the 17th chapter, you've got to be circumcised of the heart. You've got to be a Jew of the heart. A Jew is not outwardly, but of the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. God's Israel are those who are new creations. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them and upon God's Israel there in Galatians, the 6th chapter. Then he says, which quickened together with him have given you all trespasses. Look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of rituals, blotting out the ritual of circumcision of verse 11, blotting out the water washing of verse 12. Isn't that what he's saying? Referring back to that. Can you see that? Huh? Somebody say yes or no. Yes. Okay. I'm putting a lot of things together here, and I want you to see that. He's blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The rituals are gone. Back over. Matthew 26. Gosh, you know what I wish I had? About eight hours to teach this. I'm just... Do you know every time I get up, we go into this, I've got a thousand things to say so we can get through this. You know what this is? It's one big, huge equation. It's like one great big mosaic. It just goes, it comes together. Now look here. That's the next thing in the... Well, we didn't finish reading that. That's what I'll have to read. Let's read the rest of it. Colossians 2. Mary says, what about the two doves? Who's the, who's the sacrifice now? Christ. I know. They, they, somebody else. Let's go back to Colossians 2. Mary's right. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. All right. All right. Colossians 2. And he says, after he says, nailing them to the cross, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. I really need to finish this. Verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you or declare what's right or wrong. Crino is the word. It means to decide guilty or innocent. In these rituals, in judge you in any of the meats of the Jewish dietary law, in Leviticus, the 11th chapter, or any of the other meats and drinks that they did. Don't let anybody judge you in rituals of the Jews or in drink, which is <clears throat> their drink offering. Or in respect of holy days, 
Is Passover a holy day? Yep. Passover was a holy day, a holiday. We don't have a literal Passover. We have a spiritual Passover, don't we? How much time do I have? I need to hurry up. I was going to go into the Passover, but I won't do that right now. All right, no man judge you in any holy days or any new moons. They had an ecclesiastical year starting in Nisan. Nisan, that was our month, March, April. March, April. And the 14th of Nisan was Passover. And then 50 days later in Sivan, they had Pentecost. And then in, in uh, September, October, that's the month Tishri, they had, that was September, October, and September Tishri, I put. <laughs> September, October is Tishri. That's the seventh month of their ecclesiastical church calendar, right there. And at the first of every month, they had a new moon festival, and they sounded a trumpet. And they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven trumpets, and we're going to be changed at the last trumpet. You've got seven trumpets in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. And when the seventh one sounds, the mystery of God, the church is complete. And there's no pre-trib rapture. Now, I'm, I'm going awful fast tonight. I'm sorry. I've been taking prednisone, y'all. <laughs> I can't help it. Talking 100 miles an hour, and that's what that does to me. I, yeah, I get the DVD and watch it and slow it down, okay? <clears throat> Stop it. <laughs> All right, they're free. All right, now, then he says, Are any holy days, or a new moon, or of Sabbath days, which are a shadow, skia, they're all shadows. They've been blotted out, but the law hadn't been blotted out. We're priests and kings. We're the temple of God. Our hearts are sprinkled. Our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. The law is written on fleshy tables of our hearts. And the list goes on and on, doesn't it? But the body is the what body? The one body, the bread, is Christ. There's the sacrifice. We give our bodies a living sacrifice every day, don't we? So you got these three things here that would be the same three things over here. But the washing in the blood of Christ is the clothing, isn't it? Now, let's go back over here one more time back to Matthew 26. I could preach on Matthew 26 for six months. Huh? That the doves was the new birth in Israel. We're newborn in Christ, and we're the body of the church. The Christ. That's why he brought up the body, right? That's why he brought up the body for new birth in Israel. Baptism, we're baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. Baptism is our birth. When Jesus said, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he didn't say and the Spirit like there's two baptisms. When you're studying, you have to use the correct application of the word. You've got to remember, King James Bible was translated, half of them were Roman Catholics and half of them were Calvinist. Calvinist Protestants. They had, they had a knockdown drag out. There's a lot of mistakes in a King James Bible. I use a King James, but I go to the original Texas Receptus to find out what the words are. When Jesus said, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, remember when we're talking about baptism, we're talking about new birth into Israel. When you're talking about new birth, you're talking about those two turtle doves. The sacrifice happens at our new birth. The sacrifice is Christ who sheds his blood upon us. When he died on the cross, he shed his blood back and forward to all the elect of God of all time and sprinkled their hearts. Can you see that? It's, they looked forward to his coming. We look back to his having been here and being resurrected. And his death shed the blood, and the blood baptism is our birth. Because that's what Jesus told Nicodemus. He said, except a man be born of water, Kai, the Spirit. Now, that word Kai has many meanings. They translated it and as though, 
as though there were two washings. That word chi also translates even. Since there's one baptism, it cannot possibly be and in the sense of you got a water baptism and a spirit baptism. It has to be by process of elimination, even the spirit. Because didn't Jesus call his, he told the woman at the well of Samaria, I'll give you living water and you'll never thirst again. And he spoke of the spirit. Didn't he say that? So what he's saying, you have to be born of the spirit. So when we're born, that's, it's Christ is the sacrifice. He takes the place of the turtle doves. We have to be circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. We have to be washed in the blood of Christ because he is our sacrifice for us. And we're the body. That's right. Ephesians 4 and 5. That's right. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> now, go back over here to Matthew. There's a thing I really want to emphasize to you. Go back to Matthew 26. Is this hard to understand? I hope it's a lot of stuff. The Bible weaves itself together. You can't find a body over here, and it's different than a body over here. If there's one body over here, everywhere there's a body, it's the same one body, isn't it? Take, eat, this is my body. We're the bread, which is the body. So we eat the bread, which is the body, which is the church. We partake of it. And that word take is a command. He's not inviting us to do that. He's commanding us as his church, his wife, his bride, his body, his bread to partake. And then he says here in Matthew 26, he took the cup and gave thanks. Gave thanks is very important. You had four items at the Passover. Number one, a lamb. Without blemish. Number two, unleavened bread. Bread. Leaven was a type of sin, and the church is supposed to be unleavened. We're the unleavened bread. We're, the bread is the church or the body that we partake of in the spiritual Passover because the ritual Passover was nailed to the cross. Not the Passover, the rituals of the Passover. Don't let any man judge you in, in Passovers. That's what Colossians, the second chapter, is saying. Or days of atonement. Atonement means to cover with a stain or die. as the same meaning as baptized. Doesn't it? And they sprinkled the blood, the high priest on the Ark of the Covenant. And then you had four cups. And the third cup at the Passover was called Cup of Blessing. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? That is a Passover term. Why nobody has ever said that? I don't know. You know how frustrated I get listening to these preachers and they don't know nothing about nothing? It is just astounding to me. They don't believe this body is this body over here, is this body over here, is this body, everywhere it's mentioned. They don't believe that. I have never heard a preacher talk about blood baptism in my life, and I have heard a thousand of them out there. And all you have to do is read Jewish culture, Jewish customs, read Edersheim, read, read Hastings, read, look up blood baptism in, in McClinic and Strong. They'll say it's a death. Look up cup. Look up taste death. Cup, McClinic and Strong. They'll tell you to drink of a cup meant to taste death or undergo a death. If it be thy will, let this cup pass from me, not let this grape juice pass from me. Great day in the morning. And then they had something called bitter herbs. Bitter herbs. The lamb, the Passover lamb, who is that? 1 Corinthians, if you have a spiritual lamb and a Passover, the rest of it has to be spiritual, doesn't it? Huh? Look at the Passover lamb there in 1 Corinthians 5. And the rest of it is spiritual. 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. 
purge out therefore the old leaven, verse 7, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover lamb is sacrificed for us. <coughs> and they had to get the leaven out of the house the morning of the Passover. It was a type of sin. So we're the bread. He's the lamb. The cup is death to self and bitter herbs. <coughs> the most common bitter herb to the Jew is something called wormwood. And every time they would be disobedient to God, God says, I'm going to have to cause you to drink wormwood. And that's what this is about. Now go back over here to Matthew 26. Verse 28, for this is my blood of the new diatheke, new last will and testament. That's what the word means. Diatheke. I got to put this in here again. I'm going to put this in here a lot. If you draw up a last will and testament, when do your kids get to share in these goods that you're leaving them. The day you draw it up, after you are dead. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. That's eight. Hebrews 9, verse 16. For where there is a testament, a diatheke, this blood is the New Testament. Where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. That's the man who's drawing it up. When Jesus said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, that testament has no validity till he's dead somewhere around 3 o'clock the next day. Does it? Is he telling them to drink grape juice? No. He's telling them to drink the cup, death to self. Can you drink the cup that I drink of, James and John? He's not saying drink grape juice. What was he doing with the grape juice? Acting out a contract. I've studied contracts, Jewish contracts. I've studied Babylonian contracts. They acted them out before two or three witnesses, held up in their courts of the law. Three, two or three witnesses was Jewish law over there in Numbers. Numbers, the 17th chapter. Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 19. Jesus tells the Pharisees, in your law, the mouth of two witnesses is true, he tells the Pharisees. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Well, this cup is the New Testament and my blood. It'll only, what he's telling them to do is something after he's dead at three o'clock the next day, isn't he? He's not telling them, do something tonight. He's saying, we're acting out a contract tonight for what I want you to do after my death. I want you to drink the cup, partake of the body of the church. That's not crackers and grape juice. Boy, I'll tell you what, crackers and grape juice sure makes it easy, doesn't it? Pass around these crackers and pass around these grape juice. Okay, everybody holding it. No. Not what he's saying. That mathematically doesn't add up, does it? Here he is. Look here. Here's Jesus. Here it is. Thursday night. Thursday night. About 9 o'clock. The day begins at 6. It's going to end at 6 the next day. He's going to die somewhere between 12 and 3 the next day. Probably around 3 o'clock. There's, there's darkness from the 6th to the ninth hour from 12 noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So he's dying somewhere around 3 o'clock. If he's dying around 3 o'clock and he's telling them to drink the cup because it's the New Testament, but it's not going to be in effect till he's dead at 3 o'clock. He's not telling them to drink. Is he saying, be sure and run out and get some grape juice when you find out I'm dying dead on the cross? Is that what he's saying? That's ridiculous, isn't it? It's outrageous. <laughs> or go get something and have it ready. It 
how do men miss this? I don't know. Huh? Boy, they are blind. But do you know the entire church for 2,000 years has been preaching that? you know where this come from? About 158 A.D. All the church historians tell us that this cracker and grape juice or this communion that people want to call the Lord's Supper. What happened around 158 A.D.? The church was under persecution of the Roman Caesars. They were running for their lives, hiding in the catacombs below them, in the tunnels beneath Rome, hiding in caves, running for their lives. They're being slaughtered until Constantine in 325 A.D. That's when he amalgamated Christianity and paganism. And they were being slaughtered by the... And the more they were slaughtered, the more they multiplied. And when they would... They had what they called an agape love feast. And they met for that agape love feast every first day of the week because Jesus rose on the first day. All of the historians will tell you that. But when it got to where they couldn't meet because the persecution got so great, they started running for their lives and they'd carry a little flask of grape juice and a little piece of bread and meat in some cave. And just like we like to go out and eat and fellowship together, they would say, did you bring your bread? Did you bring your wine? Let's have a little prayer. And let's eat a little together, and then we'll run for our lives some more. And all of the historians tell us that's what happened. And the historians, the church historians won't even tell us not to do it. Backhouse and Tyler will tell you. They were historians. They say, it's not supposed to be doing that. That's not what it was. It started here. And it broke off of the agape love feast. It came off because they couldn't set out a feast for the poor. They were all running, and they were all poor by this time. And around 158, Enoch Pond will tell you that. Williston and Walker will tell you that. And they were Congregationalist Puritan ministers. They'll tell you that's where it started. It's a ritual. It's not what God is wanting us to do. He's wanting us to partake of the bread, the body, the church. Get in here and do everything you can and die the death, and witness, and drink the cup. We gather together here to eat the bread, and tomorrow we go out to drink the cup as we tell the truth to people, and they don't want to hear it, and they want to crucify us. And if you don't bear our cross and come after me, you can't be my disciple. They were eating the Passover, and there was a Passover lamb there, because when you look over here, look over here in Luke, or look over here in, in uh, Luke 22. This is Luke's account of the same thing. Verse 7. Then came the day of the unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. The lamb was called the Passover. The day was called the Passover. The feast was called the Passover. What were they killing? Bread? Were they killing grape juice? No, the lamb was there. The Bible says here it had to be killed. They had a Passover lamb. They're killing it. I've said before, when... <laughs> When Peter, when John lay in Jesus' bosom, it wasn't that stupid Lord's Supper that Da Vinci painted. And they're all on one side of the table. It was a triclinium like up there on the wall. That's what it was. And to lie in someone's bosom, they laid on their left, their left uh, elbow. They were served in that little triclinium. And to lean on someone's bosom meant to lean back and talk to the man behind you. It didn't mean lay your head like that. Good night. That is ridiculous. That's the, they were eating a Passover like those on the wall there. All the Jews ate their feast days lying down when they were free men. When they were slaves, they ate it standing up as they left Egypt with their loins girded. They ate it standing up. They were still slaves. Y'all know how frustrated I get with a world that don't, can't see anything? Take every one of your chapters, these Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and do what I did. Everywhere it has Passover in it, I just draw a line down where it says Passover and draw it down here to Passover, Passover, Passover. They were eating the Passover. They weren't eating crackers and drinking grape juice and calling it communion. 
And do you know that every one of the scholars will say things like, we believe that Jesus started a new thing, and there's nothing, nowhere in the Scripture to imply he started a new thing. In fact, he says, in all of my judgments, I change not. That word change shall not means to mutate or duplicate. Do you think God took the Passover and mutated it into crackers and grape juice and called it communion? No, sir, he didn't. We're in a spiritual Passover. We're partaking of Christ. We're taking to the body, the bread. We're drinking the cup. We're going through the fiery trials. The bread had to be dipped into the, had to be dipped into the bitter herbs. We're the bread. We have to be dipped into the fire. We're in a spiritual Passover. Every day. The Sabbath is every day. We're permanently stained and dyed with the blood of Christ. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. Everything that was once, we dwell in these tabernacles. We're in feasting in the Feast of Tabernacles when we feast together. I wish I could get all of this out of my head at once and give it to you. But I'm going to keep going through it. Every other week, I'm going to be teaching on this spiritual Passover. I've got so much more to give to you on it. I'm just, I'm out of time. Five minutes. Huh? Amen. No. Oh. I'm going to keep going through this. I want you to kind of get these chapters down. Matthew 26. Look at it. It'll tell you they're eating the Passover. There's much proof they're eating the Passover. They have taken this crackers and grape juice and inserted it in the church and called it communion. Do you know that more people have died over that in baptism than any other thing in the history of the church? The Catholics turned it into the sacrament of the Mass. They say Jesus is actually present in that. The real presence is there. And that when you eat of that, you eat of Christ, literal body and blood. When he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But he says, my flesh is meat indeed. Indeed, aletheis means of truth. We eat of truth. We're eating of the church, of the Word. I, I want to give all... I got a million things in my mind wanting to express to you. And I keep preaching and keep teaching it. And, and I look at a world that just don't care. About, I love God's word. Anybody twist this book. I love this book. Don't you twist this around me. I don't care who you are. Billy Graham, I don't care who you are. You think I wouldn't call him down in a second? In a second. I love this book. Don't want nobody twisting it. My Bibles are precious to me. I spent too long studying. I believe every word of this book. But you have to apply it. It has spiritual context nearly everywhere you go. It's idiomatic. It is metaphor. It is simile. It is figures of speech. It's culture. It's customs. Let me tell you what's wrong. Preachers are just lazy. They refuse to study. I research every day. I learn so many things. I wish I could express it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and for truth. God, help us to learn this book. You're such a magnificent God for giving us this. Thank you for letting us see the truth. God, we pray for the church. I pray for the church that in the elect out there. Lord, I pray you'll open the doors for the elect so we can see, so we can reach these people that are starving and hungry for the word of God, Lord. They're hearing all this false doctrine out there. God will praise you and glorify you for everything. Lead us to your elect. In Christ's name, amen. Whew. I feel like I have been run over by a train.